I'm so grateful and happy to be here. It's just been such a wonderful day. The exhibit is fantastic. Um, I was able to come for the opening and then to walk through, my wife and I came back and we walked through it slowly at leisure. Um, I took a lot of photos of things of, uh, on my phone. So I'm gonna start by apologizing for the fact that like some of these reproductions are just like me and my phone <laughs> in the catalog. Um, so um, Karen, I wanna thank you. Rachel, I wanna thank you for the um, arrangements, Dan, for the, the invitation. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Wampanoag people um, here, their ongoing histories, uh, their contemporary contributions and futurity, which is the essence of indigenous people on this continent. So T.C. Cannon at the edge of America. It's in so many ways, I think, quite a brilliant title. At the edges of genre, of media, and of distinct forms of aesthetic expression, music, poetry, um, and painting. So edges are real things, but they're also metaphors. They stand for the boundaries of categories, right? those buckets into which we pour people, objects, and expressions in order to make them meaningful. So edges thus reveal the ways that the new is created at marginal boundaries where stuff crosses over, ferments, uh, and then explodes. Edge is a spatial metaphor, um, yes, uh, but I think what's interesting and what has emerged for me over the course of the day is the way that uh, T.C. Cannon at the Edge of America um, perhaps is more interested in confounding time um, and temporality. So Cannon and his work seem to be steeped in the 1960s. Uh, no, wait, the 1970s. Ah, but no, Paris in the early 20th century. Maybe the Southern Plains in the 19th, or Oklahoma in the 1950s. So how to think about this sort of temporal kind of jumbling around. We've heard the words time glitch. We've heard mashup um, as ways of kind of thinking about that. Um, one of the things that's really struck me today, um, and I forget, Matt Hooley, it might have been you who said, who sort of invoked Walter Benjamin. Um, and Benjamin's sort of notion of temporality, which is a little bit crazy and informed by a kind of interesting Jewish mysticism, um, for Benjamin, sort of time flows and fluctuates um, and can be invoked in interesting ways through constellations, right, of objects and texts and things and have certain kinds of explosions which take you into a time that is beyond the time um, in which we occupy. This seems to me, or for me, has been sort of the experience of the exhibit, the catalog, um, uh, and the day itself. So um, I do want to say nonlinear, interestingly, we tend to sort of think, okay, nonlinear must mean cyclical. I'm just not so sure that it does necessarily mean that. It might mean something else, something bigger and even more capacious. So for me, one of the things that comes out of this is the fundamental mystery right, of art and of life and the relations among those things. And appropriately, then, I think, the show begins in that interesting little box right, which jumbles up land, time, image, music, and text, um, and person. Uh, and for me, it's a really striking, uh, striking kind of way in. So in this sense, the sort of three-part structure of the exhibit has its own crystalline logic, a kind of a didactic quality, appropriately, I think, that is helpful in giving the viewer a necessary frame for what is an intensely complicated experience. Uh, and likewise, the catalog centers T.C. Cannon and the day, I think, as well, as a conundrum, right, to be contemplated and then puzzled over from as many creative angles as possible. It's not a coincidence that one of the critical components of this show is its use of artistic responses to art, most particularly poetry um, and music. And one of the great things about the opening was to have people sort of reproducing T.C. Cannon's music and producing new music in relation um, to his music. And so indeed, here we are today with curators, artists, and scholars doing their own kind of creative puzzling. This is, in fact, how we honor an artist and in many ways, it's how we actually constitute an artist, right, is through that kind of creative engagement. Um, I found myself wondering what I have to add to the conversation. I'm not an art historian. I'm not a critic. I'm an American studies person, which is a kind of license to be a dilettante, frankly. I'm, <laughs> I'm not that good a historian. I'm not an art historian. I'm not a literary person. Um, but I like to play in uh, all those sandboxes. Um, uh, I have been working, however, on acquiring the tools to sort of think a little bit about art history. And I just want to make a quick gesture towards this project that I'm finishing off, the work of uh, the, the Dakota artist Mary Sully, who happens to be my great aunt, uh, Susan Deloria, who has this sort of trove of undiscovered or sort of 
as yet um, invisible kinds of things, which situate her, I argue, in relation to modernism, the modernisms of the 1910s and 20s in particular, most of this work was produced in the 30s, and which has the same kind of affect for me that T.C. Cannon, I think, might be thought of for us in relation to the wider world of art that, that followed. In other words, someone who was impossible to predict, but whom we have to now look at and in retrospect and completely reorient the histories and the narratives um, that, we, uh, that we tell. So at the root of the practices of, of art criticism and history lie uh, the person's subjective kinds of responses made hopefully in ways that speak to a larger kind of collective uh, understanding. So that's what I'm going to do today is um, to sort of make a number of responses. So in this sense, it's less a keynote speech than a sort of series of commentaries and aphorisms. Um, so, and I'm going to frame them a little bit around the experience of the, uh, of the exhibit itself. So Cannon was born uh, in 1946, 13 years after my father, Vine Deloria Jr., who made his own interventions into the world of Indian America in the late 1960s and early 70s. I was born in 1959, 13 years after T.C. Cannon. Damn, that's weird. So he sits exactly a half generation between me and my father. His glory years were the years of both my father's mature thinking and my own coming of age as a, as a teenager. And so for me, one of the puzzles at stake in Cannon's work then is that temporal affect of the 1970s, right, which I sort of felt flowing through our, our household. Um, it's an affect that in some ways ins insists on its own distinctiveness, right? It's not the 60s. And yet, as we stand back here and look at the 70s, they completely blur into the 60s and into the 80s, right? Um, decades, as it turns out, are poor markers of anything other than aggregates of 10. Um, so my dad was not much into art. Uh, he had a signed Fritz Scholder lithograph knocking around in his office for a while, which was rolled up, stuffed in a cabinet, tacked on the wall, put in a furnace room, shoved in a box, tacked back up on a wall until it was too beat, uh, uh, too beat up, you know, too beaten, beaten to pieces without ever really fully being appreciated. Um, I asked my mom, dad, you know, dad must have hung out with a lot of these artists. Why didn't he ever support Indian artists and buy their stuff? Right? I just bought a Norman Acres, by the way, last, uh, not too long ago. Um, but he kind of didn't, and it, interestingly. Um, but I think his publishers understood that variations on Indian pop and Indian expressionism belonged on the covers of his books. Oops. Um, and I have to think that one might actually trace a genealogy that leads us back to T.C. Cannon. So this is what I have in mind right, as I start walking through the doors of the exhibition. I enter the box at the beginning of the exhibit, and I am thrown out of time yet again. I see Land, a poem, Vietnam, Jimi Hendrix, Dylan, T.C. Cannon, and my great-great-grandfather in that picture, right, which is commonly used, visiting Washington, D.C. during the Andrew Johnson administration, where Alexander Gardner took this, uh, the, this studio portrait of him, the kind, same kind of portrait that Cannon would then later rework, right, paying attention to the tapestries and the wallpapers and the carpet, um, these kinds of things. So, um, I, so I'm freaked out, right, when I walk through the box. I mean, and it's a great box, I gotta say. Then, with this image in mind, I round the corner to view three portraits. Mama and Papa have the going home shiprock blues. It's all right, Mom, I'm, I'm only sighing. Uh, and two guns a rickera. Now, um, Hoka and Jason talked about the ways in which music seemed to be important to them in terms of the production of art. And I think it's critical to think about the ways that music is its, itself also critical to the consumption of art. And I walked around that corner, and like, what came into my head? Whoa, Mama, could this really be the end? To be stuck inside a mobile with the Memphis blues again, right? Dylan just like screams out of that section. I mean, it's, and, and it's there, right? You can't not help but feel it. In that sense, the communication between T.C. Cannon producing art in a Dylan-esque mode and us consuming it, right, in the same ways. This is how aesthetic stuff happens and the power of it. So immediately, right, the complexity of Cannon's work becomes visible to us. Um, it's all right, Ma, is obviously a tribute to Dylan, but also advancing that kind of text clue tradition of artists that go back to Charles de Muth um, and others who use images and text to craft portraits of their friends, of his friends in the Stieglitz circle during the 20s. And as Heather Atom points out um, in the catalog of artists such as Joseph Kusseth and uh, Jasper Johns. Two Guns of Ricora makes its debts to Matisse and the Favis tradition quite clear. Um, and if there's no mistaking the sort of musical connection here, anybody who gets in a band and calls themselves the Favs, right? I mean, like, 
Like, that's the coolest thing ever. And of course, Mama and Papa have the going home. Shiprock Blues makes the visible, makes clear and visible the creative intertextuality uh, between paint and song. And so this is how it all starts, right? This intensely powerful kind of intertextual uh, sort, of, uh, sort of experience. But for me, it's Cannon's guitar that echoes or that anchors the opening um, section and perhaps anchors the entire show. In 1977, perhaps around the time Cannon was painting the epic mural that closes um, the exhibition, I drove up to Boulder from Golden, Colorado um, with $500 I had earned doing paper routes and lawns, and I bought a 1971 Martin D28 guitar. It is my best and favorite guitar to this day. Now, you may not know this, but um, uh, $500 was a pretty good deal on a Martin guitar at that time. Martin guitars are really good guitars. Um, I didn't know it, but there was a reason for that. The reason was that the music booms of the 1960s had strained the Martin factory to, um, to such an extent that they actually got kind of sloppy. Um, and uh, uh, in some of these early 70s guitars, including mine, they set the bridge about a quarter inch off, um, <laughs> making it really hard to tune uh, and to stay in tune across the, uh, across the full range of the neck. So that was my guitar, and that's why it was so cheap a few years later. It cost me $1,000 with a much more pronounced waist, which emphasizes the gendered aesthetic of the instrument itself, right? It's humanized form. The humanized form of the guitar is, in fact, um, female. So the guitar is a sexualized instrument uh, in ways that might make us think more directly about the appreciation for women that shows up again and again in Cannon's work, sometimes in terms of romantic love and longing, sometimes in regret, often as the carriers of culture, uh, sometimes in the frank terms of lust. Now, the guitar is an interesting sort of material structure, right? It's rationalized, the rationalized grid that follows the neck, tuners, frets, and strings. These things are all metallic, and they're all about controlling sound with precision, right? Like, you can get exactly the note. You can tweak it in a super precise way. The organic form of the body, curves, sound hole, shoulders, is all about producing sound through resonance. And when you strum the guitar, the two of these things come together. It's quite mysterious, right? And I think that mystery is in some ways a nice metaphor for thinking about what's happening here. It's the poet, as Melanie Benson Taylor said earlier today, the poetic collapsing of two subject positions. Um, uh, or as uh, Dorothy Wang talked about, the collapsing of, of pronouns, right? The sort of like questions about pronouns, how you get beyond a non-universalized uh, kind of subject, right? This is the thing that happens with music. This is why music is so interesting and important. So it's not just that Cannon loved Dylan and made music. It's, I think, that the experience of making music and making it on a guitar puts one in a very particular kind of aesthetic place, and it's worth us thinking more and paying attention to that. So when Cannon chose to show the ink color sequences in his woodcuts, like the guitar you know, echoes. When he painted an odalisk with heart in hand, the guitar beckons. And when he sketched Susan Schwartzberg, and I don't have this image up here, but it's super interesting and cool, and included in his title a line and a double exclamation, Susan Schwartzberg exclamation mark. The guitar smiles knowingly. And in fact, if you spend time at the listening station up there, the song Susan, which is quite lovely and quite beautiful, um, taking advantage of the higher frets and the sort of delicate sound of the triple O guitar. This is a song, as he says in the introduction, for Susan Schwartzberg. Um, so, and as Karen and I were talking about, she seems to still be hanging out in Santa Fe and be a gallerist, um, you know, there. So, so the love lust right, of the guitar, a material object sitting in Cannon's studio, resonates, I think, across so many images. Favorite wife, Mona Lisa must have had the highway blues, Dutch girl, all of these things. Cannon's triple O 18 is not the instrument of flat pickers and big strummers. It's meant for finger picking and delicacy um, uh, of the folk tradition. It's the guitar of folks like Norman Blake and, more to the point, Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie played a triple O, triple O 18. Um, and of course, you know, Woody Guthrie's sound also permeates Cannon's music. Uh, as important, Cannon's triple O was made in 19, I really am gonna be a guitar nerd, I, only for another second more. It was made in 1940, and so it was part of an entire guitar folklore concerning the pre-war Martins. 
Now, rosewood guitars like my D28 were made at that time with this rare Brazilian rosewood from some of the last great stands of great guitar wood, right? Before, of course, you know, these things were logged to the point where they were no longer sustainable. Canon's guitar, the D series, uh, or the, the 18 series is mahogany, but it too is made of excellent old wood with a rosewood, uh, rosewood fretboard. So guitar aficionados like me will wax endlessly about the ways that the bindings and the glues and the interior bracing and the joint supports on these particular guitars kind of bonded together over time, functioning in the end as if it was a single piece of wood resonating. Today, uh, 1940, 0018 costs nearly $13,000. In the mid-1970s, about the time T.C. Cannon bought his guitar, I worked at Ferretta Music in Denver, Colorado, where we had at one time three pre-war Martins um, hanging on the wall, each priced at over $3,000. So I tell you all this to underscore the text on the wall label. Cannon cared a lot about music. He was intentional about it. He let it sit in dialogue with his art, and he was willing to invest in an excellent guitar that took him straight back to Woody Guthrie and to Dylan, who owned mostly Gibsons in the 60s, but turned to Martins and Triple O's and Double O's in particular in the 1970s. And can I just do a quick little digression uh, <laughs> on, about music? No. So Cannon seems to also have had that ha One of the reasons the listening station is so cool is right, you hear voices and you hear people playing. So Cannon seems to have had that musician's habit of turning on a tape recorder when friends were around jamming in the studio. But I also want to emphasize this wasn't simply a musician's thing. It's also a native thing, and I think a really important native thing in the 1960s and 70s that we haven't really explored quite as much, or at least it was in my house. So my dad had a Sony reel-to-reel, -reel, um, which got pulled out and turned on whenever stories were being passed around. My grandfather, when he visited, almost always insisted on being recorded when he was telling stories or singing songs. Uh, the result is the world is surprisingly full of old tapes of him, um, which are oftentimes read as being rare and, in fact, are proliferated, you know, kind of all over the world. So periodically someone will be cleaning out an attic and they will, they will send me a tape. Um, and, and, of course, I always listen to it to try to see if there's something interesting and new. He had a canon of stories, right, of his own, and they all tend to be um, kind of the same thing. But the folks who, you know, I came up last night with my wife to see Rumble. I have not had a chance to see it yet. It's fantastic. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, will recognize, I think, what's important here, the kind of triangulation of Indian people, music, and technology, right? And T.C. Cannon was right in the heart of that. So if we stick around this mid-70s period, 1977, when I bought my guitar, um, it's also the year that Roland Barthes published his collection of essays, Image Music Text. Yeah, didn't see that coming, did you? Uh, which captures the sort of structuralist to post-structuralist moment, noting that the possibility of a real epistemological break had not been realized since Freud and Marx, and that the last century had been marked by the habit of what he called an epistemological slide, right? No break, but an epistemological slide, a turn to relativity, process, frame. And he distinguished between the work and the text. The work, he said, the old thing, right, can be seen. It has substance. The text, the new thing, is a process of demonstration. It speaks according to or against certain rules. It is experienced in the act of production. Just three years later, summarizing the decade of the 70s, Clifford Gertz would suggest that the world had arrived fully in an era of blurred genres. Philosophy was literary criticism. Fantasy was empiricism. History produced as equation, documentaries as confessions, parables as ethnographies, epistemologies as political tracts. And for canon, painting as music, music as poetry, poetry as painting. He was, in this sense, right, uh, a leading edge philosopher and artist of his moment, right, indebted to no one, an original thinker of this moment, right, that sat within that entire context. Well, these theoretical statements about the moment of the 1970s, I think, get us to some sort of degree of trying to capture the key, some of the key dynamics visible in Cannon's work. The song, uh, Mama and Papa Have the Going Home Shiprock Blues, is not a caption for the painting. 
nor is the poem collector number three simply a caption or an explanation of the painting, as Matt Hooley sort of explored um, um, earlier, right? It's a poem about form as collection. It's got cubist kinds of things. It's got different sorts of interests, right? We see voice and at odds with. We end with humming, right? This is something that like goes beyond, right, the image um, itself. So they sit together. So I just want to flag you. This is the speaker's scary moment when we just go into like random thoughts. <laughs> um, I found this morning's session um, the whole day, of course, really interesting. But the conversation about canon, um, which I think you know, we kind of came to at the end, you know, here Karen as well, um, to be super interesting. Janet and Austin kind of leading us the way into this. And, you know, canon, I mean, so we got canon and canon, and of course you can't resist the puns and the jokes and the, you know, kind of inter interplay between the things. Canon, right, it's, it's not a thing, right? Um, it's not an agent, right? It doesn't do things. It's the product, right? It's the product of people, institutions, doing what people and institutions do, which is they build categories and they exclude things and they include things and they make sense of these things by building these kinds of categories. But we all fall into the habit, I think, of talking about the canon as if it has agency, right? as if it is a thing that does certain things, as if it has a motive power and an intention. And with that, and then I think there are verbs that attach to the canon. I just started making a list of them as we were going through the session earlier. Um, erase is one. People get erased out of the canon. What's the active, the, the sort of a synonym verb here? Vanish, right? To vanish someone out of the canon, to erase them. Reject to recognize that that thing is out there, uh, but to just say no, right, to that thing. Uh, to explain, ah, oh, well, here's why Indian stuff isn't in the canon, right, to, 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 you know, rationalize. Ignore, shrug, right, don't care if it's in the canon or not, doesn't matter to me. Suppress, right, which is sort of halfway between erase and reject, right. All of these things might be thought of as the kind of verbs that, 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 um, that give action and life to canon formation. And it seems to me then that once we start thinking about those verbs, we have to think about what the counter verbs are that the artist tries to mobilize. You want to suppress? I will activate. You want to ignore? I will insist. You want to erase? I will make present. You want to reject? I will contest. You want to explain? I will argue with you, right? All these things, I think, are to be found in, uh, in Cannon's work. And I, I, I think making that conversation speak, I want to take, a, take us back to the early afternoon conversation where Matt Hooley and Bill Yellowrobe both said, hey, redemption is not the word, right? Redemption implies inclusion. It implies I have battered down the canon. I have made my way um, into it. And in some ways, I think their arguments are very, very strong and correct, right? This is not necessarily a productive thing, uh, you know, for us to happen. Um, I forget which one of, it might have been Bill, you, Bill, who said to love the unredeemed, or maybe it was someone else. I, I was taking notes really fast. To love the unredeemed, right? That seems to me to cut at the mystery um, that we've been, I've been trying to talk about in terms of canon, you know, and his, uh, and his work. So, so we might make the pun and say that canon is a canon aimed at the canon, right? I, you can't resist this kind of stuff. I think this is what the work, you know, actually does. And it takes us back to that question of time and non-linearity. Right? Um, the mashup is one way of sort of thinking about disrupting linear temporality. Um, it takes me back to Walter Benjamin, and I have to say, as I was reading the catalog, I was completely floored when I turned the page and saw this image, the Jew of Vilna, right? And thinking, whoa, what's this doing in canon stuff? And then to read in the caption, right, that he was wearing, right, uh, a Star of David, right, when, when, he, when he died. This is interesting to me, right? And it's interesting to me in part because of my own sense of coming to consciousness around certain kinds of native epistemological issues through Walter Benjamin's kind of fusion of Marxist critique and Jewish mysticism, right? And I'm wondering about sort of how this has been for canon, you know, what that might have been looked like, you know, might have been like for canon. We're in the realm of only speculation at this point, but it's telling to me that this seemed to be an important thing to him. And I wonder, right, what future directions might have looked like, you know, around this kind of, uh, around this kind of engagement. So constellation, in the sense that Benjamin uses it, is aiming for sacred time. Right? to step out of mundane time, profane time, and aim for sacred time, and to use that in the interest of, of thinking about transformation. So canon was transformational 
right, in the field of art. I think we can all agree on that. Just as this exhibit aims um, to transform American art through the inclusion of Native American artists as part of the canon rather than just some sub-canon. This is a good and noble mission, and I think we understand, though, it's also got complication um, surrounding it. He was able to shift Fritz Scholder's uh, field of gravity, um, an act full of consequence. Um, Importantly, in, in the conversation here at the very end on sort of like the relationship between student and teacher, I think was super enlightening. And I want to thank the, the folks who knew, know much more about this um, than, than I do. I learned things and I appreciate it. But Cannon's story is also one of personal transformation. And nowhere is that as clear as in the dividing chasm um, that was the Vietnam War, what Dorothy Wang called the, a nodal moment, right, in his, in his career. Cannon's motives. Um, for enlisting, you know, seem a little a little murky to me. There's the suggestion that, well, he was doomed to be drafted anyway. Um, there's the frustrations of his time in San Francisco, precipitating a perhaps rash kind of enlistment, or the important place of warrior service and status in the Kiowa and Caddo social world. What is clear is how much, oh, this is my artsy thing. This is me, like, with my iPhone, walking around, trying to take pictures of the texts. Uh, so you can see my phone and my fingers. Uh, it's, it's, it's very aesthetic, isn't it? Yeah. Could, you, could we put this in, in, in a show sometime? <laughs> Phil finds canon, you know? Do this kind of thing. Um, the, this case, right, of canon's letters up there, I think repays close study. It's why I wanted to take pictures of them, and I kept blowing them up on my phone and trying to read them. Um, because it's not just that he had multiple forms of poetic consciousness, you know, a kind of beat stream of consciousness thing happening, but the, what these letters represent is an acute and literal um, record of him coming to his senses literally around issues of violence, colonialism, genocide, complicity, and guilt. This positions him in another way in a super, super complicated space. It also shows him as quite a brilliant writer, right? These things are both agonizing and pleasurable to read as texts, right? You take joy in his ability to use words, right? As content, you suffer with him, right? That is a hallmark of great writing, you know, in and of itself. So one of the most evocative, I'll get off of <coughs> those goofy things. One of the most evocative images in the exhibit, um, the place where people stand in some serious contemplation is soldiers from 1970. Read alongside Cannon's letters, his other drawings, um, it suggests a master key, perhaps, into the experience of war in thinking about his aesthetic. And to get there, we might look at images like John Wayne's bullet, Indian with beaded headdress, or his hair flows like a river, each of which gestures to the kind of power activated by the act of war. War offers the warrior right, a chance to become something other, to feel the bird, the fox, the coyote, the otter, the other being that was your spirit animal, the thing that was on your head, on your body, to feel that thing come to life in the heat of battle. So warriors went to war for their people, for social status, for material goods. But putting oneself in the position of killing or being killed was also a powerful spiritual experience, a connection between yourself and the sacred, an ecstatic becoming of something else, right? It's this incredible experience of ecstasy and horror, I think. So to kill and to risk death was to become something other in another way as well, to take the spirit and even the form not of your spirit being, but of your enemy, right, of your enemy, to endanger a kind of, uh, or engender a kind of dangerous cosmic uh, closeness. And then having killed, one was transformed yet again, because there was always a before, right? Anticipation, desire, adrenaline, nervousness, and then there was always an after. Shakiness, consequence, impurity, perhaps guilt. Those who have killed have nothing further to say about innocence. They require healing and purification to manage that transformation. And there's no going back from the experience of war. I'm re reminded, uh, Santi Frazier again, of, of what you said, poetry as an impossible place, the place of the slicing of a binary, right? It's a powerful kind of, um, kind of image and thing for, us to, thing for us to think about. All these things are present in soldiers. Cannon's recognition of himself uh, in his historical enemy, 
and of himself as an American soldier engaged in an imperialist venture. He uses the word genocide himself, we should remember, right? As an American soldier engaged in this, as not simply a Kiowa, but also as a blue coat, right? As a bad guy in relation to the place that was Vietnam. But soldiers who plan to survive must both confront and temper any suggestion of their badness. Cannon did this. And it's no coincidence that his sketches of, of himself and death, uh, his afternoon meetup with Kirby Feathers, these things reflect his own awareness of death, his Kiowa warrior sensibilities, and the historical consciousness that always underpinned work. Uh, his work visible in the frequent bomb imagery, in his embedding of words and sketches, in paintings such as the tale of a Bigfoot incident in the American vernacular. When you kind of go up close to this thing, you'll see that it is full of small kind of reminders, like things just knotted in pencil, you know, dim kind of palimpsest kind of, kinds of things here. These are all important in thinking about this warrior kind of consciousness, as is his interest in evoking life-affirming love sexuality, fertility, right, pregnancy, all of these things. It is, I think, the root of this kind of impenetrable uh, complication, right, that was T.C. Cannon. So the result is a kind of meta-scaled set of figure ground, figure ground movements between the Kiowa Six and the classic Western modernists, between Santa Fe and Oklahoma, uh, a road that had, bears a lot of travel, right, Hauser, Lynn Riggs, Scott Momaday, right? There's a lot of traffic between Oklahoma uh, and Santa Fe. Figure ground between the smart circles of the IAIA students um, and the military, between death and regeneration, between pride and guilt, between choices and guilt, between humor and dead serious, between American in Vietnam and Indian in America. At the end of the day, Cannon was a wholly American, wholly original American artist, drawing on American and European traditions through reference, gesture, elaboration, critique, quotation, source, and strategy. At the end of the day, Cannon was a wholly original American Indian artist, exploring themes and motifs, remembering violence and conquest, and life-affirming culture, in Gerald Visner's terms, a post-Indian warrior of survivance. So as much as we want to break down the canon of American art, I also want to remember that the canon of Native American art is really important. It actually matters, right? These things are not mutually exclusive. They are something more than dialect. They are dialectical and they are something more than dialectical. So canon could be fully modern and fully indigenous. Cosmopolitan super well-informed, read, a, a man of the world in the extreme, right? And also, autochthonous. This is my new favorite word to talk about, the indigenous autochthonous, right? Standing on its own, right? Wholly original. The collision of these things, right, makes me think of a guitar, right? This is how a guitar works, right? This is how these things work. Those things have their own separate identities, and yet the music that is produced, right, the mystery of music that is produced comes out of the collapsing of difference, even as difference remains. So I want to close by returning to the other cover song that is part of the exhibit up there. I, I, I just keep pointing people to the listening station. It's super cool to hear this stuff. The song is called Louise by the now mostly anonymous Greenwich Village folky Paul Siebel. Uh, it was released in 1970, so it would have been kind of at the heart of this. Louise was immediately covered by Linda Ronstadt, Leo Kotke, Bonnie Raitt, uh, and many others. It's a song of the 70s, um, and it's not an easy song. I'll just put the lyrics up here for you to contemplate for a moment. I'm half tempted to try to sing it, but you know. <clears throat> uh, 
I don't know, I kind of need a guitar because I'm not that good a singer. <laughs> I kind of, like tonality sort of like flows away from me. Uh, but it's just got a sweet ending, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm hesitating, I'm hesitating. Louise rode home on the mail train. Somewhere to the south I heard it said. Too bad it ended so ugly. Too bad. She had to go that way. You see, I've drifted like way out of tune. <laughs> Let's just do the last line. Good night, Louise. Good night. So I started playing Louise. You won't believe it from what I, you just heard. I started playing Louise about 1979. It was about the moment when I had achieved a basic level of proficiency. Um, I could get through a song, you know, passably well. The question was, could I ever really get inside of a song, right? Could I try? to make it a performance that was something more than just craft, right? Something that reached for a kind of aesthetic congress, the kind of thing that T.C. Cannon had with his art. In other words, right, could I actually be, you know, good rather than just passable? Uh, the answer to this is no, like I actually couldn't, right? Um, <clears throat> I was a music major, I was a trombone player, you know, I was going to go for it as a musician, I realized I did not have the talent. And then I had a whole other time, I was like, I'm going to be in a band and we're going to go for it. And then I realized, like, you know, there's people who are good and there's people like me, you know, <laughs> who are just kind of okay. But there was this moment where I thought, you know, one should aspire, right, to do better. One should aspire to be an artist, even if you can't quite pull it off. And the moment for me where that happened, one moment was the last verse of this song, Louise. It smacked me on the face on exactly this question. So there's two verses that lay out the complex, a complex picture of Louise, right? A prostitute is her trade, right? Or a woman who merely swapped favors. Or a woman who was not half bad, right? Sexual innuendo in that line, it's a good line, should take a back seat to what was basically a statement about her basically good character, right? As a person who knew her life as tragic, right, she cried. How can you not sympathize at her death? That's what the last verse asks you to do. So the song's genius sits there. That the last verse points to the fact that there is a collective social engagement with the death and the life of this one particular person. That's why you have to sing this song with respect. right? There is sadness here, collective sadness. There is complicity. We were all part of this, right? There is grief, a grief that for some people includes tears. There's a recognition that nobody ever actually took the time to know her. So the social world is one cold wind blowing here. The social world, the history of settler colonialism is one cold world blowing. So farewell, T.C. Cannon. Welcome back, T.C. Cannon. It's a bit of magical correspondence to link him too tightly with this song, but he did record it in his studio. And isn't that what aesthetic consciousness asks of us? So Louise is an elegy for someone who was never fully understood, for someone who took emotion and intimacy into the realm of commerce, not without some critical anxiety, for someone who lived a life that included some bad stuff, for someone who cried with regret, for someone who thought hard, lived, sometimes lived hard, and created hard. For someone who died too soon and returned somewhere to the South. Thank you. <laughs>